St. Irenaeus, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. The Holy Mass which follows is the Mass, the ancient Mass, for the vigil of St. Peter and Paul, whose feast is kept tomorrow. As with the Mass of the vigil of St. John the Baptist, sung on this past Saturday, the vigil Mass is actually the original Mass of the feast, which, as you will recall, followed uh, at dawn after an all-night vigil of prayer. So the church in Rome would keep all of her very great feast days. So in a sense, we transport ourselves in spirit to Rome and prepare ourselves as Roman Catholics to keep the very great feast of these two great apostles of our church, of the church, Peter and Paul. The Mass of the Vigil has about its character today a penitential one. The priest wears purple vestments, and there is no gloria or creed sung. And that is good because it enables us to remember and make a little reparation for all of the sins against the apostolic see that are committed today by so many other wise, well-meaning Catholics who would say that a pope could be teaching heresy and you could resist the pope and fight about it and all the rest. A terrible situation in which the church finds herself. One of the victims is our belief in the papal infallibility and the infallibility of the Catholic Church, which is sullied or stained in this sense. And actually, true Catholic doctrine, orthodox teaching, is denied and lost. We are indeed in a terrible state. As Catholics, we need very much St. Peter and Paul. Let us offer them our, our sincere homage of reparation this evening and prepare ourselves to keep tomorrow and during its octave a very beautiful feast of St. Peter and Paul. The saint who was in just more recent times placed on this date, St. Irenaeus, is a saint who is very worthy to occupy this position the day before the great Apostles' Feast because he was an early Catholic martyr and bishop very devoted to the See of Rome, to which at least twice he made a pilgrimage from far away France in order to beseech the Pope uh, to attend to certain matters of the Church. Now, the name Irenaeus means a peacemaker, and that is exactly what he was. He's a saint who recommends himself to us today because by his character and his uh, personality and by his Style, he tried his very best to make peace. And yet at the same time, by his doctrine, there was no question of any compromise. Very often today, those who want no question of compromise, by their style or personal character, are far from promoting peace. And because of those secondary issues, why then sometimes the unity of the church is hurt and there are divisions and splits and everything else. St. Irenaeus is a wonderful saint against that. In other words, how without compromising a single comma in the, in the whole beautiful uh, uh, treasure of our Catholic faith, could we at the same time keep as many united with us and with the church? St. Irenaeus shows the way. He was a disciple of St. John, the evangelist and apostle, by means of St. John's disciple of um, uh, St. Polycarp of Smyrna in particular. Then he went from Greece, where he was born, or Asia Minor, uh, to the Greek colony, which lived in southern France, around what is today the city of Lyon. So there he was ordained a priest and became a great missionary, he gave up his own language of Greek to speak the local language of the people in which to preach to them. And uh, because he was a man of great learning, he was able to guide the church in his local area and by his books, the whole church, against heresy. At that time, if you can believe it, we're talking the end of the first century already, the same problem that we are facing today, we call it the New Age Movement, which is essentially Gnosticism, was uh, attacking the Catholic Church. Our saint did, to defend the Church against Gnosticism, what St. Pius X did 
a hundred years ago this year. That is to say that he uh, categorized, he very carefully wrote down, uh, uh, categorized, and then answered all of the false teachings of the Gnostics. Many heresies are like octopuses with uh, legs going all over the place, and you have to get it into a box, you have to study it, and you have to take it apart carefully. That's what St. Irenaeus did, as well as many centuries after him, that most worthy successor of Peter, St. Pius X. By the five books that he wrote way back then, he was able to anticipate and to answer some of the blasphemies that have been in the Catholic press, excuse me, the, the, the world's press and media just the last two or three years. You know, these false gospels, Gospel of Thomas, and, and then the, the different blasphemies concerning St. Mary Magdalene and our Blessed Savior. All of that is Gnosticism or the New Age movement, Gospel of Judas in particular. St. Irenaeus answered all of those objections so very long ago. And because we are in the same church as St. Irenaeus, we can profit from his instruction still today. Yet at the same time, and this was his great grace, it was a marvel that he was able to he was able to maintain charity as much as possible. So, for example, once he besought the Pope to be merciful to those who had been misled into the heresy of uh, following a certain man named Montanus. And these people were a bit like the charismatics that we have today. Many claim the name of Catholic, and yet they're called Pentecostalists. Well, once again, nothing new under the sky. That heresy had gone on a long time before, and, the, and he went to Rome to beseech the Pope to suppress the heresy, but to beg him to show mercy to those who had been deceived. And we as Catholics, we would feel the same way about the situation for those of our Catholics who have been deceived by this false Pentecostal or charismatic movement. Then he made a second pilgrimage to Rome later on in his life, concerning the matter of calculating Easter. Because you will remember that for many centuries uh, in the whole church until the Council of Nicaea, and then in Ireland for centuries after that, there was a dispute as to how Easter should be calculated, and the Holy Father was of a mind to be very strict and to impose the Roman practice, such as we follow, on the whole church. But those in the East had a way of observing Easter according to the Jewish calendar. They observed Easter on Passover. The Roman Church didn't want to do that because of the Jewish influence. But there were those who felt it was the tradition and they were very attached to it. So he besought the Pope once again to be merciful and gentle. The situation was just left alone. And eventually, by the time of the Council of Nicaea in the 4th century, why then the matter was all settled and resolved. He was a practical peacemaker, as much by his initiative as by his own character and personality. And yet, what a magnificent foe of heresy, St. Irenaeus. Imagine, we are still benefiting today from his inspired writings uh, at the very end of the first century. That's the glory of Catholicism, which is so solid today. Let us beseech St. Irenaeus in particular to pray for us, to make us worthy Roman Catholics, worthy children of the apostles and the saints, as indeed we are. God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.